This morning I want to draw your attention to the book of 1 John again. It's been a little while since we've looked through uh, or kind of worked our way through this book. We've been kind of off and on touching on some highlights here in the first four chapters. And now here in chapter 5, uh, this finishes off this section. I won't say we won't come back to something else, uh, maybe from earlier in the chapter or something another time, but um, this kind of finishes this off. Of course, we've had Thanksgiving and Christmas and all those things, so we haven't been here for a little while, but First John chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse number 12. First John chapter 5 and verse number 12, then right on down through the end of the chapter. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. If any man see his brother's sin as sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, there's a variety of things here. <clears throat> and, of course, we, it mentions there's several verses there. It talks about the sin, not, a sin not unto death, and sin unto death, and things like that. That's a, a totally, in a sense anyway, for our purposes today anyway, that's a, a sideline issue, and we're not going to get into that uh, this morning. But I do want us to focus, especially here this first day of the year, I want us to focus on two words, or really one word, maybe depending on how it's, it's given. But basically, I think that um, the, the whole idea would be two words, we, sometimes maybe we would think of it, I, but we know, K-N-O-W, we know. And as we think about those words, what better truth is there for us on the first day of a new year? Some things that we do know, some things we can know, and uh, even truths that we've been taught maybe through the past year or previous years, maybe for many years at this point, but there are some things that we know. And I want to focus on that. We'll call them to your attention here as we go along. But you can find a number of them right here in that passage that I read to you here this morning. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray together and ask God to, to open His Word to our hearts. Dear Lord, we do thank You for the things we can know. We're glad to know that we can, can know You. We can trust You uh, with our future. But would You also speak to our hearts today on these truths that are found in this chapter as well. Help us to face the new year with some confidence, some knowledge of what really matters in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to public radio, <clears throat> Michael Feldman's What Do You Know? Uh, he, I'm not sure whether he's even still on the radio at this point, but, but uh, he, had, he would begin his, his program, basically, early on in the program anyway, with he'd have a few comments, and then he'd ask the audience, well, what do you know? And they'd usually, I think the idea of it was that they would respond not much, you, and then he'd go on with the program. And uh, just some sort of a little quirk of his, uh, his program there, uh, again, the, the title of it being, What Do You Know? But uh, actually, that, that would be a good question for us sometimes when we start delving into spiritual things. What are those things that you know? And I'm afraid sometimes it would be not much. You? And we almost, maybe for some, it might almost be a badge of honor, I guess, that, that oh yeah, I, you know, I don't really know much, I'm a poor lost sinner, and, and you know, I'm just trusting in God to get me through or something, and, and I'm afraid that's not, that's not what 
God intended for us. Maybe I'm not, maybe I shouldn't even say I'm afraid because I'm glad that's not what God intended for us. But He wants us to know some things. He wants us to have confidence in Him. We find some of that truth there in Hebrews. But we want to really focus on what matters. Actually, it's been over 30 years ago, or maybe right around 30 years ago, maybe, that George Barna conducted a poll. The poll was supposed to be of born-again believers, people who really knew the Lord. And he asked them the question whether they agreed or disagreed with this statement. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Different people can define truth in conflicting ways and still be correct. All right, that's the statement he gave to them. Do you believe that? Is that, do you agree or disagree? Let me, let me give you the statement again. This is the way he said it. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Different people can divine truth in, in conflicting ways and still be correct. All right, now you get the picture. These are apparently, supposedly, born again believers. Do you believe there is a, a real truth, an absolute truth that never changes? Something you can count on, or does it just depend on the person? Can we, can we disagree and still all be right? And, and we're talking about spiritual things now. We're talking about, you know, the Word of God, basically. By his survey, more than 75% of so-called Christians... Now, again, we're talking like 30 years ago. But by his survey, 75%, more than 75% of so-called Christians agree. They felt like, you know, there really is no absolute truth. You just, you know, you kind of... You do the best you know, and, and we can disagree, and which, you know, we can disagree, but we can't disagree about God's Word. We can't, we can't say, well, I don't see it that way. That is absolute truth. But again, more than 75% of so-called believers did not believe that, that there was absolute truth. Now, that could apply in a variety of ways. I mean, I'm not saying that every one of them believed each, each uh, thing uh, how would I want to say? Not that everybody disagreed that we could really know that, for example, Jesus was really God or, or that uh, He was God's Son, that the Bible is authentic, that it's real, we can trust it, or that heaven's real. I, I'm not saying that every one of those didn't believe those things, but they didn't believe in absolute truth, apparently. And again, I'd suppose that it's even worse now because we're talking a long time ago. And so this morning, as we face a new year, maybe we need to go back to some things we do know. Now, some of this is not just a matter of, of confidence. If we, we look honestly, read through that chapter, it may not be just that, oh, wow, yes, we can know this and we can know that. But there are some things that it's kind of maybe, maybe even saying, we have a, an intellectual knowledge. We know this is true. We know this is, is absolute truth. And of course, it's from God's word. And so there are some things that we really can know. As you're probably aware, we do face a pretty daunting battle against the truth, against what really God says, what is absolute truth. And, of course, Jesus' birth, we just came through that season again and, and uh, commemorating that. There may be many that, uh, I'm not too sure about that. Maybe His death, or certainly His resurrection. Oh, I, I don't know about, you know, I, he, I think he's a good teacher, but I don't really know about all this. Even sometimes maybe the reality of salvation or heaven or certainly hell. Though, those things we would, as a culture, we would kind of want to push to the background. Well, I don't know about all that, and, and I, I'm not quite sure what really is, is true. And our foundations are under attack. Psalm 11.3 kind of refers to that kind of a, a time period or a, a culture. But there are some things that we can and need to know beyond a doubt. And so John talks about them here. A number of things. Let's just kind of look up through. I counted one time in, uh, in this, uh, the, the uh, various references here, there are 22 verses that refer to something we know. 22 verses. And here we can recognize a few of them. Verse 13 says that we could know that we have eternal life. 
And then verse 15, we can know that He hears us. God hears when we pray. Um, verse 18, we know that sin is wrong. If, if you belong to God, you don't sin. At least a habitual thing. That's not saying you could never stumble and then have to go back and ask God for forgiveness. But, you know, that's not, that's not part of a, of a holy life. And then um, down in verse number 19, we know that we are of God. We belong to Him. Verse 20, Jesus came that we may know God. Um, that we may know Him that is true. And uh, so there's various things along that line. We may not know everything we'd like to. Even as we face a new year, we may not know everything we'd like to. But we can know several things, even in uncertain times. And I want to just remind you of those quickly here this morning. First of all, let's go to one of the latter verses there. And maybe verse number 18, we could just ask, I'm going to ask them as questions. But do you know... <clears throat> Do you know that you have victory over sin? Do you know that God has given you the power to rise above a sinful life? It says, tells us there, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now sometimes we can, we can almost get tired of the message. And we, we might, it might just feel like, oh, that's old hat. We've heard that over and over and over again. And, and, you know, really, what's the point? But it is vital for us to have a right understanding of what God expects. And He expects us to rise above this world and the allurements of this world and the sin that would so easily beset us. And this is one of those areas where a vast wing of the church world today has sort of just given it up. Oh, you know, I don't really think you can live above sin. I mean, we're human after all, and church people call themselves sinners. They live, at least partially, like sinners, and yet they expect to go to heaven, and I guess that would be with sinners, but it just can't be. Sin has to be judged of God. Sin cannot get into heaven, and we need to recognize that truth. We need to recognize how, how vital that is. Do you live in victory over sin? Please don't ignore this vital fact. It's so important for us to recognize how God expects us to live. Now, let me just stop for a moment here and just remind you, that does not mean you will not be tempted. You can be tempted. And sometimes we almost... Because the temptation is so severe, we may almost associate that with sin. It's almost like, oh, I've been tempted so bad, and, and I just feel so miserable, and I, I, I must have, have grieved God. But temptation is not sin. And when those temptations sometimes come in like a flood, you may have failed. You may have fallen. You may have given in. Even if it was only in your mind, that's, that's one of the key areas. God has to keep working on us and helping us to renew our mind and to allow us to have full victory over sin. But you can know that you're living in victory. You can know that God is pleased. He not only views us as righteous, but He truly makes us righteous. That's the, the difference between imputed and imparted righteousness. Not that there's no imputed righteousness because there, there is in a measure, but some would just, what that, what imputed is, is kind of the idea of that God sees us as righteous even when we're not. But He imparts His righteousness to us. That's what, that's what enables Him to see us. Now, that's all through, through Christ, and that's where the imputed part comes in. So it's not in our own righteousness, but it is through what He, through seeing us through the blood of Jesus, then we are made righteous. We are justified in Him. But we can know that we have victory over sin. Secondly, in verse 15, we can also know that He hears us. Do you know that your prayers are being answered? Oh, I know. There may be some times that you, you kind of struggle with that, and you may feel like, oh, I prayed on and on and on, and it just feels like I'm not getting anywhere, and God hasn't come through, and my needs haven't been met, or whatever it may be. That loved one is still lost. There may be a number of those things that we struggle with sometimes, and answers to prayer is a rather difficult subject. It may not always happen just the way we, we would like it to be. And maybe it's difficult to deal with 
properly, uh, and particularly two different areas, because first, it seems that some people have their prayers answered, or it would appear that way, and yet they don't seem to be living right. And we could so, sort of base, uh, maybe they even base their, their relationship with God, oh, well, God's answering my prayers, so obviously I must be right with God. So that's one area. It, it can be a, a, a confusing thing because, well, why does God sometimes seem to come through for somebody that doesn't really follow after, after God? I don't have all those answers. Sometimes I believe God uses answers to prayer to help bring someone around to God, but I don't have all those answers necessarily. But it is a, it is a challenge sometimes. And then secondly, you can have people, maybe you would feel like you're even one, and you're trying to be a careful Christian, you're trying to do what, what God wants you to do, and yet you kind of wonder, it just seemed like, I, I prayed and prayed, and it just seemed like the answer hasn't come, or at least it hasn't come like I wanted it to come. But we need to remember also that God is not just a vending machine that, you know, we put in our prayer and He pops out the answer that, you know, whatever I pray for, whatever I want, I just, if I say the right words or I say it in the right way, then God just has to do it. God's not a vending machine. But we need to recognize that if we follow after Him, He does hear us. And we can know that we have our petitions. But our prayers must start with a relationship with Him. They need to be according to His will. They need to be what He wants. You see, sometimes God does us a favor by not granting the requests that we make if He sees that they'll harm us eventually. Have you ever prayed for something that, that looking back, you're kind of glad God didn't answer? Or um, God answered, but He didn't say yes? He didn't give you just what you asked for? Sometimes the silence may seem long, but we have to know. We have to keep that confidence. God hears us when we pray. He cares about us. He knows our every need. He knows how to step in and minister to that, that deepest need of our hearts and lives. However, I want us just to pause for a moment. When was the last time God answered prayer for you? We need to, to start doing some evaluation if we have to go way back. Say, well, I, I just don't know. I haven't really, God hasn't really answered my prayers. Sort of do some inspection. Have you been praying like you should? Have you been praying according to His will? And have you been diligent about your prayers until God comes through? Do you know your prayers are being answered? Thank God He still answers prayer. We can trust Him. Verse 13. <clears throat> do, you know have, do you know that you have eternal life? That's what he says, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Really, this question, question is of utmost importance because it's really our only hope. We have to know that. Simply knowing a lot about God, simply knowing a lot about what it takes to serve Him doesn't really quite pass the test. We have to know that we're in right relationship with Him. We must be sure of our eternal destiny because we know we're confident in our relationship with Christ. Two aspects of that, for, real quickly. First of all, there are imitators. There are imitators. Things that, that even would maybe make us feel like we're right with God, even if we've been struggling. Maybe it's church attendance or the church rituals, you know, taking communion or various other things. Maybe it's, it's your financial giving, your good deeds. All those are imitators. They kind of make, maybe make us feel good, but they don't really prove that everything is clear. And so maybe we need to go a little bit further and not just focus on those external things that we so readily associate with being a Christian and go just a little deeper and say, well, there are some real indicators, some things that really do show that I know God and that I have eternal life. It begins with a transformed life, a clear conscience, knowing that God has really met your need, knowing that you are a different person, knowing that you really truly have a, a love for God and a love for other people. That love is a key component. Jesus even told His disciples, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, 
that you have love, love for one another. Maybe a, a fourth one that I could just mention quickly is that we also should have a heavenly focus. It disturbs me sometimes when we could talk all about being a Christian and ready to go to heaven and all those things, but we don't really have a, a priority that matches that. We don't seem to, to really be focused on heaven, but a lot on the things of this world. Do you know you have eternal life? One last one I want to mention to you that just kind of sums up the book a little bit. You can find it in chapter 2, verse 21. I'll just read them to you here real quickly. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Chapter 3 and verse number 19 as well. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Chapter 4 and verse number 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the last one I notice with you is, do you know the truth? Do you know the truth? Is it up for debate for you? You see, we've just talked about that a little bit. And there are a number of people that they, they would say, well, there is no absolute truth. But could I just remind you in closing today that here is the truth. This is what God has given us to get us through to heaven. We still find it in the Scripture. I know many may undermine it. They may try to, to find the truth in uh, some other place. <clears throat> but this book is what will get us safely to the other side. Study it. Live it. Teach it. Bank on it. Don't be ashamed of God's words, but we can know what it takes to please God because He gave it to us. <clears throat> I've used the Scripture here today a series of, of questions. That's not the way it gave it to us exactly. He just said, we know these things. But John tells us that we can know. We need to know. You don't need to go through your life questioning everything. Well, I don't know if this is really true. I don't know if we can count on that. God wants us to trust His Word. He wants us to bank on it. He wants us to know that we can, can rely on His care. We can rely on His plan. Even for a new year, we can know some things. We can know that God will hear our prayer. And so I ask you this morning as we enter into this new year, do you know, ultimately, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Thank God He has the help and grace and victory that we need. We can know. They were right with God and that He hears us when we pray.